So uh, today, the TMCC Open Genealogy Lab is, pr is proud to, pr uh, to uh, present Jennifer Wonderby. She is the Reference and Access uh, Services Librarian at the Phillips Library of the Peabody Essex Museum in Rowley, Massachusetts. Uh, her main capacity is uh, in this role is to assist patrons, which include museum staff and the public, with accessing materials within the library, whether in person or remotely. She began working at the Phillips Library as a manuscript processor in 2013 and has been with uh, the reference team for almost five years now. She has a BA in history from Union College and an MS in Library and Information Science from Simmons College. Today, she'll be giving an overview of the history of the Peabody Essex Museum, which will help explain the breadth of the holdings of the library. She will also be highlighting specific genealogical resources within the library and explaining how to use the online catalog to search, save, and request items. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. Uh, out here on the East Coast, it is still, or it's afternoon. Okay, so um, today I'll be talking to you about the genealogical resources in our library and how to access them, as Sue said. I'm sure many of you have already guessed that I am presenting today from my home, so I apologize if there are unexpected background noises. It is also allergy season out east, so I apologize if I sound a little stuffy. So um, just for my flow and ease of presentation, if you have questions throughout, please note them and I'll be happy to address them at the end, okay? Um, so the first slide is the family tree of our institution. And this is important because um, we were, our founding institution was uh, not incorporated until 1801, but people came together and, and founded the East India Marine Society in 1799. And as you can see, there's quite a diverse body of institutions that have come together over the years to form the Peabody Essex Museum as it is today. This explains kind of the breadth of the collections within the library um, and um, the, the subject matter that it holds. So the earliest formal recon recognition of a library was with the East India Marine Society. So um, the society was founded as a charitable organization. Um, the dues were used to support families um, of members who died while at sea. Um, the members who were all masters or supercargoes of sh ships that sailed from Salem, either around the Cape of Good Hope or the Cape Horn, um, were charged with keeping logs of their voyages uh, to be deposited in the library and collecting items to add to a cabinet of curiosity. There's a little sketch of an early, um, an uh, at the East India Marine Hall as it looked pretty early on the right side of the screen. Um, it got much more cluttered with time as they gathered more natural and uh, man-made curiosities over the years. So today the library is actually housed in the museum's new collection center it's located in Rowley, Massachusetts. Uh, it's approximately 15 miles north of the museum. The building is uh, much newer than the former building we occupied, and it has all the appropriate HVAC equipment to properly store collections. It currently has enough room, though we tend to fill spaces quickly. Um, there is plenty of free parking for our patrons. So this is our reading room. Um, our library is what is referred to as a closed stack library. So if you've done research in other uh, special libraries, special collections, rare book libraries, as they're often known. Um, you'll know that you cannot simply browse the books on the shelves. We do have a small collection of books that are self-help, but um, we ask patrons to schedule materials in their account. We'll talk about that later in advance. And the libraries then, the librarians then retrieve the requested materials for your appointment. We like to think of this as a little white glove service. Um, I hope you do as well. Um, our reading room is designed to seat 14 researchers. It has computer stations, a microfilm reader, and perhaps most importantly, comfortable chairs. And this is a, a new feature in our reading room and we're very happy with that. 
Um, we have a display case where we can show off. We have a little exhibit that rotates about quarterly and shelves um, in the background there and along under the window behind where the photographer is, sta is standing um, include publications of the Peabody Essex Museum and its legacy institutions, uh, materials that were researched at the Phillips Library, um, newly cataloged books, and the binders on the right-hand side of that shelf there uh, contain physical copies of our finding aids. And as I mentioned, these are all self-help. So the reason you have tuned in today, uh, the genealogical resources that we hold. So we consider print materials, items that are published. We use the Library of Congress system to classify our materials. And we are about to, or I'm about to describe um, some of the published resources in our collection. And for the following examples, I will show you um, the record for the item within our catalog and the item as it is found elsewhere on the internet. These items were specifically chosen to show you um, that we do have some resources that are available while we are closed. Um, a very small portion of our collection has been digitized at this point. So um, uh, until we reopen and we can welcome you into our reading room, um, you can see the resources that are available online. So vital records, I, and I'm sure you, you know, anyone who's been a researcher for a while is well aware of these, these uh, resources, but I'm just going to go over them fairly quickly. So vital records, um, early town records of births, marriages, and deaths were transcribed and published in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, this catalog record, you can see we've provided links to the various volumes of the online versions of this book. Um, some, some resources may be available online and don't yet have a link on it. That's one of the uh, projects we're sort of working on while we're working from home. Um, you may be aware that the, the date for copyright in general, everything pre-1924 at this point should be uh, out of copyright and available. Um, so if, if you don't find a link in our catalog, you may want to do a Google search to see if someone else uh, has digitized it. And as you can see in this record, the Library of Congress, Boston College, and the Harold B. Lee Library have digitized these volumes. The Phillips has not. Um, genealogies, also in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was common for people to research and self-publish genealogies of their familial line. Their research was quite extensive, um, culling town and county land and probate records vital statistics, church records, and even corresponding with far-flung relatives to gather records that were kept in family Bibles, anecdotal stories, and we have a large collection of public genealogies for lines that populated Essex County. Uh, another good resource is town histories. Um, these were often published for centennial, sesquicentennial, or bicentennial celebrations. Um, founding um, citizens or prominent citizens are often mentioned or a short biography is provided within the te text. Um, we have histories for uh, Essex County and some other towns in New England and beyond um, within our collection. City directories published in many municipalities. Um, city directories were precursors to what I think of as, you know, the yellow pages, phone books of my childhood, um, which are now also seemingly obsolete. Most city directories contain a listing of residents, usually just the head of household, their street address, and possibly their profession. The directories include a listing of businesses, organizations, and institutions. Directories may be organized alphabetically by last name or may list entries geographically by street address or possibly both. Um, the library holds the city directories um, from 1837 
1977 with a few gaps. And like most of our resources within Essex County, Massachusetts, we have a fairly full set of directories for the towns within. Um, we also have other towns in New England and beyond. Uh, the catalog should be consulted for the years that we hold. Um, social registers, often known as blue books. Um, they're first published in the 1880s and historically listed members of the upper class or social elite. So um, if you're from a Shishi family, this might be a good resource for you. Newspapers. Um, Due to the fragility of early newspapers, we offer um, our newspapers on microfilm only. Um, we have a large collection from the 18th through 20th century. The catalog record may say microfilm or may refer to the more general term microform, but um, either way, they will be provided on a reel and can be viewed in our reading room. Um, the holdings are for the most part in the catalog and are best searched by publication title. Uh, it's important to remember that titles for newspapers changed frequently throughout the years uh, with transfers in ownership. For example, the Georgetown Reporter, which is up on the screen right now, was only published from June 1851 to November 1851, but it was preceded for a year and a half by the Georgetown Weekly Reporter. So the library also holds a physical spreadsheet of our newspaper holdings sorted by title and geographic location. And again, the catalog should be consulted for dates held. Uh, cemetery inscriptions. Uh, transcriptions of gravestones and other graveyard records for some of our local cemeteries can be found in the library's print collection. The best way to locate these are to search Philcat with the name of the cemetery, which may be difficult if you don't already know it. Um, some items are simply binders of transcriptions that were hand copied by local residents. Photocopies of these manuscript typescript records um, in binders have been deposited by the transcribers in our library, but also in the Salem Public Library and other Essex County institutions. The more, um, the rarer items that we hold that wouldn't be found elsewhere as much are our manuscript collection. So we have over a linear mile. We measure items um, by shelf space that they take up. So we measure it by the linear foot and it's over a mile. Um, and it's unpublished material, largely handwritten, sometimes typewritten. We have multiple categorizations of our manuscripts but they can all be searched in our catalog. And when in the, in the reading room, we allow patrons to look at one folder or volume of manuscript material at a time. Um, this will be important uh, later when we talk about requesting items. So we do of course have manuscript collections that contain papers all the way back to the 17th century, some that precede and up through the 21st century but our holdings are strongest in the 19th century. For genealogical research, our family papers, church records, and diaries might prove most useful. We would suggest consulting account books, photograph albums, business papers, court and shipping records if you have information that would lead you to believe your ancestor might be included in these records. So one of the big problems that faces our genealogist researchers um, in the archives is that our manuscripts are processed to a certain level. So um, many of our manuscripts of our early Salem um, families are quite voluminous. Um, so as an archivist, you can't read every single piece of paper and inventory it, so it's, it's put into buckets. So correspondence from 1850 to 1851, it may get more granular than that, um, but this makes it a little bit um, more labor intensive for someone who's looking 
to see if there might be a mention of an ancestor within the papers. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, so a general topic, correspondence received by Richard Derby. And because Richard Derby was a main player in Salem shipping, um, it's probably broken down by, by years and dates. But um, for a smaller collection, it may just be incoming correspondence and outgoing correspondence. Um, but not every person that Richard Derby corresponded with will be um, listed as a subject heading in our catalog, which is how you search. So um, similarly, business names and geographic locations might not be indexed either. Um, it's just the, the main ones that we try and touch upon. So some of these records can actually get quite lengthy if there are um, a lot of correspondence. Um, so an example of a way to dive into our records that um, may be a little bit of a back door would be if you knew your ancestor was a tanner, this might lead you to look in Cordwainer account books of a similar time period to see that if your see if your ancestor maybe sold raw materials to shoemakers. Um, likewise, knowing your ancestor was a member of a particular church or social cl club or even friends with Richard Derby in the same social circles will be helpful to us in pinpointing, excuse me, manuscript collections that you might um, find fruitful. So um, now you've learned a little bit about our resources you can start finding the specific items you like to see. Uh, the searching is done in PhilCat, our online catalog. As of 2013, all of our catalog cards were made digitally accessible through this platform. Um, to be clear, when I talk about catalog records, I mean a digital representation of those cards and drawers you used to shuffle through, um, not the object itself. So. Um, you can use the short link that's on the screen right now, or you can navigate through our website, pem.org slash library. So um, we would suggest that you create an account or log in before searching, but you will also find out later that you will be prompted to do so if you start with searching our catalog and then click on the request button. So the account is necessary to save materials or request to see them in our reading room. Um, from the PhilCat homepage, press login um, or my account. If you don't already have an account, you can click the first time user link to create one. Otherwise, just log in. Remember your username is your email address. If you do not have an email address, um, you'll need to contact us by phone so we can create an account for you. Um, our phone number will be is listed on our website and it will be provided on the second to last slide. When creating an account, you will be required to agree to the library rules. Um, these are most relevant to visiting the reading room physically, not so much for just searching our catalog. Um, you will also be asked to agree to our copyright policies, which basically puts the onus on our researchers for satisfying copyright requirements for any reuse of materials. This is what your PhilCat account will look like once you are logged in. Um, this is a shared account between uh, the uh, reference librarians at the library. Um, so uh, please note that the pages are being updated soon and there may be some cosmetic changes coming. You can always return to the catalog from your account by clicking the top left link. Here we'll go over some basic searching techniques for using our catalog. 
we have a more in-depth PDF guide of search strategy, strategies that can be requested via email or phone. So this is the basic search screen. When you are searching, it's important to use as many terms as you can to pull up different results, including variant spellings of your ancestors' names, relatives, business associates, um, anything that might connect you to relevant records. So in this example, I'm looking for records to related to, to Richard Derby. So please note that searching two words like this will pull up all um, records with the words Richard and Derby listed anywhere in the record. So you'll get records for Richard Wheatland, because Richard is there. You'll get records for Elias Haskett Derby, because Derby is there. If you want to, um, to specify where within a record you want the system to search, you can use the drop down menu on the right to limit where your search terms appear in the record, such as title or author. Um, putting your search term, um, you can also limit, sorry, limit by um, the type of material, so manuscript versus print material. Um, serials refer to our journal collection or um, periodicals, as they're sometimes called. Um, and then putting your search terms in quotes will return results with that exact phrase. So if you want Richard Derby as a phrase, put it into quotes. Um, you can also limit the material um, by type of material, as I previously mentioned. Um, looking at the results page for Richard Derby, we have 45 records. This is with it in quotes. You can again limit the material type here as well on the right hand side and change how the results are sorted by using the drop down. For example, if you wanted the earliest records at the top, you would sort by publication date. If you wanted the most recent publications at the top, you would sort by publication date descending. When you have found something um, that you would like to request to view in our reading room or to save for later, you will request it in the Philcat system. Um, for print and microfilm items, you just click the red request button in the holdings information. This will take you to a request form in your account. Um, the information is imported from the catalog, so you don't have to fill out the fields by hand. Um, if you have any questions or requests, special requests for a librarian to see, um, you should enter them here. Um, the other fields surrounding that, which are personal notes and researcher tags, are not seen by the library staff. <clears throat> um, so, um, if you, yeah, you can use the calendar function at the bottom of the form to select a date to visit. Unavailable dates will be grayed out, um, so you can only choose dates that we are available. Um, you can see in September we've already blocked off Labor Day weekend and we are not open on Sundays. Um, um, so uh, if you are ready to schedule an appointment, make sure you submit your request. Um, otherwise, we will not receive it. Alternatively, you can build a list of items to use later by clicking the Save Request for Later. Um, this is the perfect function for now. People can gather records they're interested in in their account, and when the quarantine is lifted, travel plans are confirmed, you can log back in and schedule a date to come and see your saved items. Okay, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. There are two types of manuscript collections. Those that have online finding aids, which is the inventory for the collection, and those without. If a manuscript has a finding aid, there will be a link to it here. When the collection has a finding aid, it is re recommended not to use the red request button. Um, um, but to request via the link. 
Um, this takes you to another system and um, you can click on individual items that you want to see. Um, it will, um, and once you find an item that you want to see and click on it in that system, it will take you to a similar uh, page filled out in your account, just like the print record. Take note of the physical description, or also called the extent of a collection. Some collections like this one are very large, so it's especially imperative that you request the contents you specifically want from the collection. We cannot pull 151 boxes for a visit, um, nor would you be able to get through that material even in a week. Um, so um, it's, it's better to look at the finding aid and figure out where the likely sources um, your, your ancestors might be. If a collection has a finding aid, it will look like this. So once you get to this system, uh, you might want to take some time to explore it and become familiar with the structure and format. It can be a little confusing if you're unfamiliar with it, um, but if you've researched at a lot of archives, it's a format, it's a platform that um, a lot of special collections libraries use. Um, you can always print to PDF, uh, just be aware that the system formats it with a lot of spaces, so it will be a very long document, but if, you, if you're not physically printing it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too much of a problem. So at the top of the finding aid, you'll see the title of the collection and the identifier, or what we refer to as a call number, and in this case is MSS 901. This title at the top will change as you navigate through the finding aid. If you're ever confused as to where you are, check here. Some important parts of the finding aid to be aware of are the scope and content note, which details the contents of the collection in a narrative form. And if there are um, very important documents, they will most likely be called out individually. If there's a document from a presidential, um, from a president, it will be in here um, in, in the scope and content note. Um, also, the biographical or historical sketch, which provides historical information about the organizations or people in the finding aid. This section is well researched by our archi archivists and is worth reviewing if you don't know much about the people in the collection. Um, so the other reason this is important is, uh, as you're well aware of, there are, there's the, uh, love for naming people after other relatives. So we may have multiple collections, and in this case, we actually have two different David Pingrees. So by reading the biographical note, you can determine the life dates and other relevant facts that might help you narrow down if this is the one you are indeed looking for. Um, so to expand and view more in the section, you just um, click the see more button and the main pa panel navigational panel for the finding aid is on the right hand side of the page of the screen at the top of that panel on the right hand side is a search bar where you can search within the collection for example if you would like to find items related to asa bixby pingree in these papers you would search here these are the results you would get which you can search within further using the search bar on the right or sort by relevance, title, date. Um, there are two types of results. The top result is a heading for a subseries to Asa Bixby, which you can tell by the number three preceding his name. So it's the third subseries within the family papers. You can click that to see all the contents that are organized under the Asa Bixby papers. Um, sorry. Um, the lower results are the actual contents that can be requested, otherwise known as individual folder titles. Um, 
related to ASA Bixby, which you can tell because they list a box and folder number. So this is the collection organization. Um, so the David Pingree papers, the title is at the top, and those are his life dates within the parentheses. Um, and below that, those are the uh, series within the collection. Uh, if you click a down arrow, um, oops, uh, the, <laughs> you may notice that the request button on the top right is grayed out. And when you hover over it, it says requesting is not available for this record. This does not mean that the collection cannot be requested. You just have to navigate to requestable contents. Um, the finding aid inventory is organized by topical series headings, as I mentioned before, and some of them have subseries within. So these headings contain the contents, which are the folders and documents that can be requested and viewed in the library. Because we only allow you to view one folder or volume at a time, we require you to request a folder or volume at a time. So you can navigate through the series headings um, by pressing the arrows next to them. For example, if you want to see what's in the personal papers, you would click that arrow. And then the subseries appear. And perhaps you want to see what's in the personal correspondence. And you click that arrow and you would see the contents within. Um, you will notice that the title at the top has changed from the collection title to reflect the contents you are viewing, personal correspondence, letters received. Um, and it includes the box and folder number. Um, the bar below will show you your path to these contents. You can also see, there's the bar below, sorry. You can also see on the right side panel in the blue box where you are in the collection organization. And now the request button is no longer grayed out and can be selected. You select the request button when you have found the items you like to view. When you press request, you are taken to this saved requests screen. The items you have requested are listed. Um, please note your request has not been submitted at this time. It's essentially in a shopping cart, like if you were on Amazon, and you still need to check out. You can return to the finding aid and continue to request items, adding them to your cart, or you can schedule a time and submit the request. Select the request by clicking um, either the checkbox or the select all button. And then use the calendar function again to uh, select a date and press submit. So as I mentioned earlier, we are currently closed as most libraries are and all librarians are working remotely. Normally we would welcome you into our reading room Mondays through Fridays. Um, from 10 to 4, sorry, and Saturdays from 9 to 1. It's important to note that we have appointment only days on Mondays and Fridays, and these appointments must be made to business days in advance. Our system actually shuts down access to those dates, and this is so, they tend to be our quieter days, and this is so librarians can schedule meetings and whatnot, so that if we if it's Wednesday and we have no one in on Friday, we know that we can schedule meetings or a special project, um, get together to work on a presentation, et cetera. Um, but we were pretty, pretty usually occupied in the reading room on Mondays and Fridays. <clears throat> um, if you do not have an item to request, um, you'll have to come in on drop-in drop -in days because requesting an item is how you book an appointment. Uh, you can see on our February calendar that we were closed the Saturday before and the um, Monday of President's Day. No, yes, President's Day. Um, so again, the calendar days that are not available are grayed out. Um, our holiday closures are scheduled 
are listed on our website. Our Google business page is, is kept up to date um, because that allows us to tell people if we're only um, closing certain hours, like we might have to close at 3 p.m. for an event, or we might have to open at 11 a.m. because we have to go to an all staff meeting. Um, and then by making an appointment in advance, even if you're coming on a drop in date, this allows us to contact you because we'll know to expect you if we need to close unexpectedly for weather in the Northeast, we have snow in the winter or um, more recently for health reasons. Um, very unexpected. <laughs> so, um, contacting us. We strongly prefer patrons to contact us via email. This email address is monitored by four librarians, two full-time and two part-time, and it allows us to ask follow-up questions pretty quickly. Um, and we answer emails in the order that they are received. Um, you may also leave us a voicemail. Please be aware that this number will always put you directly into voicemail because the reference librarians spend most of their time in the reading room or doing research or shelving in the stacks. We are, it's very difficult for us to take phone calls. Um, so if we need to discuss something with a patron via voicemail or via phone, we schedule a time to call them. It also, um, negates problems such as with cell phones. Um, we recently had a patron with a 617 number, which is a Boston area code, that called and left a message, and I returned a call at 9 a.m., and it turned out she was in California. So that was 6 a.m., and I don't like to call people that early. So um, that helps us by having an appointment. You can also tell us when it's convenient for you to discuss with us. Um, so as stated earlier, um, we'll be happy to welcome you when we reopen. In the meantime, we strongly encourage you to follow us on social media. Um, our social media content is maybe geared more towards um, visually pleasing items, but you never know when something that is related to your relative might show up. Um, and we like we also share a lot of news about Essex County and other resources in the area, especially now that everyone is focusing their attention on building their online resources. So with that, I would be happy to open it to questions. Okay, we do have a few questions in the chat box. Ah, yes, let me get over there. I'm gonna, can I, should I get out of my screen sharing? I just quit, yeah, quit sharing your screen. Okay. And that should take you right back into the blue jeans. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, records digitized, if not, any plans to do so? Yes, we have lots of plans. Um, it is a resource issue. Um, we have a small staff. We have um, recently acquired, literally just before the shutdown, a new piece of equipment. Um, that will allow us to shoot um, large flat documents. Um, we also have a, um, a machine that will allow us to shoot bound items, um, but we are restricted on the size of those items. Um, and we also are in the process, of course, everything's been put on hold, of hiring a digitization technician. So, um, some of the things that I kind of pointed to in the handout um, that because we can't um, handle in-house, we have uh, partnered with the Digital Commonwealth and we've sent um, items that are difficult to share with patrons in person, such as glass plate negatives. And we have two collections that are up there totaling about 3,000, possibly a little bit higher um, images from the Herman Parker collection, which he was a gentleman who lived in Marblehead and his house overlooked the harbor and he took lots of pictures of boats and yachts out on the harbor, also of his family and family home. And then Frank Cousins, whose um, images were a little farther flung, um, he uh, largely photographed architecture 
um, interior and exterior in Salem, Essex County, and a little bit wider. He went to Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York City, some other places. And so if you look on the handout, I'm pretty sure that's on there, um, but it's Digital Commonwealth. And that's a great resource if your ancestors are from Massachusetts because it's a collective. So um, a lot of libraries from Massachusetts digitize things and host them there. Um, we also collaborate with the Internet Archive, um, and we have recently done a lot of our publications, and our goal is to get all of our publications digitized, but it will take a while. Uh, Peabody, George Peabody, who is the uh, namesake of the Peabody Museum. If we go back to, or we go back to that second slide. Sorry. So the Peabody Academy of Science um, was founded with a large and generous gift from George Peabody. Um, he founded, he was a very big philanthropist, excuse me, and um, uh, uh, funded many institutions in the area, and the town of Peabody, Massachusetts, was named after him. Um, um, we have um, his collection of papers. I mean, not exclusively. You can find them elsewhere. Let me see if I can do a quick. Oh. Are you still seeing my screen? Yes, uh-huh. Great. I'm going to filter by manuscripts, and it's um, not that one. It's MSS 181, and it's one of our biggest collections. You can see it's 255 boxes and 173 volumes. So that's a very large collection. And we've had people come from England to uh, review his collection because he spent most of his life over there. Any other questions? That'll make our class. Yeah, that'll make uh, Jim. Jim was the one who asked about um, his. He's actually related uh, uh -huh. to the George Peabody or Peabody, um, fourth cousin five times removed. So thank you for that question, Jim. Uh, while I'm waiting for the rest of the class uh, to to type in any questions they have, um, because we do have a few new people logged in today for the first time, could you kind of go into a little bit more detail about what a cabinet of curiosity is? Oh yeah. Um, so, um, that's a good question. So literally it would have been one of those sort of glass cabinets and it displayed, um, items that were found to be fantastical or foreign of interest. Um, and it was kind of the precursors to museums. Um, the East India Marine Hall was open to the public. I can't remember if they charged entrance fees in the early days or not. Um, but as you can see in the sketch, it included models of ships, which is still a large part of our collection, um, the Peabody Essex Museum. And, and I know that um, my husband is from the West Coast and I know a lot of people say Peabody. Um, in Massachusetts, we say Peabody. So uh, just just FYI, we won't criticize you, but um, that is how we pronounce it on the East Coast. Um, so yes, um, our maritime collection um, is very large and impressive, and we host a lot of rotating shows. So from our own collections, we bring in collections from other museums. Um, for our maritime collection, and we have a permanent gallery for maritime um, art and artifacts. Um, and so it's not just paintings of ships, it's models of ships, it might be cannons from ships. Um, there's a book of sailors' tattoos from the 1800s. Um, and my favorite object from the Cabinet of Curiosity, which you could probably find through Googling. Um, it's pretty famous. We have um, 
some of our natural history collections, we have a large taxidermied collection, and there's a penguin that was brought back by an early explorer. And when it was taxidermied, uh, the taxidermist had never seen a penguin before. And so he was given quite a lengthy neck. Um, let's see if I can pull this up. There we go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, so you can see that like, uh, it, of course, um, so the, these mariners who traveled the world further than, you know, most people didn't leave the town they were born in in those days, they were privy to, to things that people never got to see. So this was a way to show people some things. And of course, the facts weren't always interpreted as we hope museums present them today, which is with accuracy. Um, but um, yeah, it could have been they brought back coconuts, they brought back sea turtles. Um, we have uh, collections, a large collection of oceanic art and um, objects that were probably not nicely taken from the locals. Um, but our collection is is quite impressive in oceanic art. So, other questions? Um, while you were on talking about uh, accessing books through your online catalog, um, the example you used uh, showed how, you know, different uh, out of copyright books might be, you know, like volume one might be in one library and volume two might be in another library. Uh, do you know offhand, just as an example, the, the one you used, um, are all of those um, when you click on them, you know, if you're if you're distanced like we are, uh, would you be able to have access or are they behind? Like, for instance, I saw that you had one from Boston College and one of the volumes yeah. is that behind a firewall or can you just click right into that? No. So these are all free and available. So I didn't show you anything that you can't access from uh, from anywhere. So. If we provide a linked resource, it is not behind a paywall. Excellent. Now, you Excellent. also mentioned that you, you're, you, of course, the bigger part of your collection uh, centers around New England, um, but you said other areas as well. Could you give us some samples of what other areas that would include? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's difficult because, I mean, people come who were perhaps born in Salem then went and set up what we might consider canteens on you know in the deltas of the rivers in china where trade with americans happened frequently so i mean it could be as far flung as far flung as um salemites who moved abroad and and continued to trade with america um, um we have um a, along with oceana a uh, large Hawaiian collection. Um, we have, there's definitely mariners who settled in Hawaii. Um, Stephen Reynolds is one who comes to mind. Um, and then, you know, people who moved or traded with San Francisco and then continued to correspond home. But really the bulk of our collection is people talking to people in Essex County or people who lived in Essex County. Um, and yeah, um, so family members who spread out, who would keep in touch or their family members back in Essex County might have ended up with their papers upon their demise. Yeah. But it, it's kind of hard to, to quantify it much more than that. You um, brought up, uh, we've had a lot of guest speakers in our class over the last two and a half years. Uh, and we've, we have talked about uh, city directories before, but we've never talked about social directories. You, you know, that one slide you had on social directories. Would it be possible, um, you know, for you to kind of like, can you actually open up one of those digitally and kind of show it? Let's see. Well, so this one was taken from Google Books. So I'm just going to say North Shore Blue Book. Let's see what I get. Um, my personal opinion is that, um, oops, I didn't, 
finish my thought there. Um, my personal opinion is that Google Books is not as user friendly as the Hathi Trust or the Internet Archive digitized books. Just for your information, but you can. That. So this is the Internet Archive. It presents the book like twofold, whereas on Google Books, you might just get one page. Often you can use the settings to change it. You can even ask to see more. So the North Shore Blue Book, this is 1915. I'm just going to skip into it. So you can see this lists the summer residence of Nahant, which is a, it's the sort of a peninsula off of, I want to say Lynn, um, and it's like the fancier part of town. So probably they don't list any residents of Lynn. They most likely just, in this case, just summer residents, not year round. So these are people from Boston, Boston Brahmins, as we call them, um, who summer. Um, it would be the equivalent of people who in your area probably summer in Lake Tahoe or maybe a little bit further, I'm not sure, or New York goes down to Long Island, uh, the Hamptons. So they probably had similar things um, again. So then we zoom in a little bit. Oh, it's, oh, that's it's, a great example. Literally lists the, the name and the address at which they reside. Oh, and then there is an asterisk that says indicates permanent residence. Wonderful. So if you were looking for land records or, or um, house, the genealogy of the house of your ancestor, house. Yes. Uh, this would be really valuable. Yes. And and that's actually another resource. Um, it's not through us. It's the um, oh goodness, this um, Salem. I feel so out of touch from my normal knowledge base because I'm not saying my normal spiel over and over again. The Salem, um, it's not historical society house history. Historic Salem, um, and they have, you know, basically those older houses that have plaques on them that say, you know, John Smith's house, 1821. People who have a plaque on their house, uh, it's authorized through Historic Salem, and as you can see, you can browse ha house histories, or you can browse by street. Um, you can request a history. So this, if you have Salem residents and you know addresses, this is this might be an interesting resource for you. Um, and then the other thing is, is with our Frank Cousins at um, Digital Commonwealth, which because he photographed a lot of architecture within Salem. And unfortunately, the filters aren't great. The metadata isn't 100% accurate um, because we were working off of a handwritten inventory from 50 years ago. So not everything that's listed under Salem is actually Salem. Um, there could be some Danvers houses and whatnot in here. But this is also a good place if you know the address of an ancestor's house. Um, and these photos were all taken between 1890 and 1920. And Frank Cousins um, owned a art shop called The Beehive in Salem, and he sold um, images out of there as well as other sundry items. Now, um so all of my 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 class attendees they can all sign up for a free account right oh yes there's there's no cost to um so the uh there's no cost to our catalog there's no cost to visit us other than getting yourself to rally massachusetts um and there's no cost to access the any of the resources that i talked about today so the frank cousins images um the books that we've digitized that are on internet archive um and and um, the ones on Internet Archive may not be as of use 
do genealogists yet, although we will be working on some that may be of use in the future, but they, you can actually search by Phillips Library and you can see, I think we have 175 um, books up there right now that are both visually pleasing and um, publications like the American Neptune is a maritime, quarterly maritime publication that we published, the PBD Museum published from, oh gosh, I don't know what date it started, 1941 to 2002, I wanna say. And so other people had digitized the earlier, um, some of the earlier things and they were behind uh, a paywall. And what we did was we said, we're releasing, um, we're not releasing the copyright, but we're allowing sharing of our um, collection. And so we we filled in the gaps of those collections. So people, I think the University of Michigan is a big one who had digitized some of our earlier issues. We then supplemented the, the remaining issues that hadn't been digitized. And we will continue well, to do so. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, when you do reference, I, I know since this COVID-19 thing happened and our library closed, uh, you know, our whole campus closed just like everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, we switched over um, for our reference call, you know, when we do a reference question, uh, we now, uh, like for instance, what I'm doing on Saturdays with my one-on-one -on -one, uh, genealogy research appointments, I send them a link just like I did with you today so we mm -hmm. can actually see and hear each other in real time. Um, are, is your library doing video reference calls? We are not. Um, we have discussed it, I think, um, because of the sort of scattering of projects that we're working on, um, we haven't yet set hours that we could be available that way. And we, I think if someone reached out to us at research at PEM.org with a request, we would be happy to set a one on one, but we don't have a system yet to do that. We, we're using Google Chat in house, so. Um, or uh, the equivalent, it's called Google Hangouts. Doesn't sound very professional. Uh, yeah, I've actually used for, not for this class, but for another class I teach, I, I've actually used Google Hangouts and it's really not bad at all. No, it's not bad at all. Just the, the word hangout sounds kind of casual. <laughs> now, um, a question about your manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, you do not have to be like in the blue book to have your family papers in the manuscript collection, correct? Correct. But what you should think about is the scarcity and cost of paper in those early days. So your family, the more wealthy your family is, the more likely they are to have papers or have substantial collection of papers. Um, also, likewise, if, if they had a business, they're more likely to have papers in the collection than if they did not. Um, and then they may just be, so a lot of people will come to us and say, you know, John Smith lived in Salem in 1660 and unless he owned land, um, was literate, had a business, um, it, there may not be records, uh, primary source records. He may be mentioned in a vital statistic or as paying a pew tax in a church book. Um, or in city records, um, but he may not have personal papers about, you know, that include correspondence between him and a wife or other such things. Um, and the other thing to know is that, you know, these records, the fact that a lot of them have survived this long is very impressive. I mean, it's certainly possible that it was used to fuel fires at some point because people didn't think you know, you have a 10 year old letter and you need to stay warm. You're not thinking of preserving that for people in 2020. <laughs> Definitely. However, you might find their name if they weren't, you know, any of those above categories, you might find their name in a ledger in somebody else's book. Exactly. But, but this is where it, you know, people want us to just find John Smith and it's, it's not that, it's not that straightforward. It takes a lot of um, legwork on the on the behalf of the researcher to actually find that. And you know what? Researchers and librarians are kind of the unsung heroes of this of this uh, COVID nineteen 
shut down. You know, we've all heard about the wonderful nurses and doctors and truck drivers and, you know, uh, to-go restaurants and all that, but, but definitely the librarians deserve, you know, a little, um, little plug here because they are, even from home, continuing to help people do their research. So, you know, thank you, Jennifer. I mean, that was uh, a wonderful presentation. So, uh, oh, let's see here. It looks like we might have another question in the chat box. Um, let's see here. Okay, so one one of my students have already signed up for an account in your in your catalog. Wonderful. And, and so uh, it, it's important to know that so the witchcraft trials of 1692, they were in Salem Village. That is currently Danvers, Massachusetts. So it's one of those um, parishes that split off and formed its own town later. So even though Salem is the name that's associated with witchcraft, it it actually physically took place in Danvers. Yes. So let me think. So Tracy's asked, just, just so for the recording, yeah. uh, for the sake of the recording, Tracy, one of the attendees has asked that you show how to, to do uh, sign in for an account. Yeah. So if you, if you go to this web address, um, that will bring you to our catalog. And there's two ways you can um, you can search for something, and when you find something, you can press the red request button, and it will prompt you to create an account. Or on this screen, you can um, the red my account is circled in red, or up on the red bar on the far right, it says log into your account. There's an arrow pointing. If you click either of those two things, it will. Um, take you to a screen and you click on the first time users link and then you fill out the information we require and that's it. Okay, uh, so for the benefit of the class, any last questions? We'll give her just a few moments. And uh, I assume, Jennifer, that it's okay that they uh, email you directly if they have a question, or do you prefer uh, that yep. they go through the account? Um, my email address is, or you can do our, um, like I said, so um, the, the research at PEM.org is, is monitored by the entire reference team. And of course, I'm I'm the only one looking at my email that I'm aware of. Um, and of course, we have limits to what we can answer while we're off site, but we're still happy to let you know that that is something we'll be able to answer when we get back to our collections or, you know, give you some guidance about what you might do in the meantime. Wonderful. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. So I, I wanna say thank you very much on behalf of, of our class. It, it was a wonderful webinar. I've, I've certainly learned a lot. I've never actually gone into the social directory, so that was something new for me. So I was very thankful to learn about that. And with that, we'll just say thank you. And even though we cannot clap as a class here, I'll clap for the class. Thank you very <laughs> and, much uh, for we'll your attention. You.